Hello, I'm Mike Ackerman, a pediatric cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic and director of Mayo Clinic's Long QT Syndrome Genetic Heart Rhythm Clinic and the Winland Smith Rice Sudden Death Genomics Laboratory. And I'm here with my colleague and co-author, Dr. Pedro Carabella. Um, yeah, I'm Pedro Carballo. I'm a consultant in the Division of General Internal Medicine, and I'm also the uh, director of the Clinical Decision Support Program for uh, Mayo Clinic. We're really excited to share with you some of our thoughts about an upcoming article of ours that will be in the April issue of Mayo Clinic Proceedings, and it's entitled Institution-Wide QT Alert System Identifies Patients with high risk of mortality. And we'll set the stage for this a little bit. We're quite excited about this. This is really a first ever, uh, as far as we're aware of, in terms of an institution setting up a system to sort of level the playing field across the entire campus of physicians who would be ordering electrocardiogram with respect to the QT issue. The QT issue means is a lot more than just two letters to a QT specialist like myself. We've been called by the American Heart Association to get better at identifying patients who are at risk for QT-related sudden death, for QT uh, drug issues. There's over a hundred medications that are FDA approved that have as an unwanted side effect of the medication the potential for not only QT prolongation but QT triggered sudden death. And organizations like the American Heart Association have said that we need to get better at identifying these at-risk individuals or individuals who might be at risk for this unwanted side effect. It's a huge issue. There's been over thousands of deaths each year in the United States that are directly attributable to QT triggered sudden death from QT drug-induced long QT syndrome and drug-induced sudden death. There are, as I mentioned, a hundred medications, and as we know, these medicines are not just medicines that cardiologists use. They're used by physicians across all of the disciplines, and yet they may not be aware, some of the physicians, about this potential unwanted side effect or what to do about it or how to monitor for it. And I guess, Pedro, what was it, um, in early 2010, we made a decision that one way to uh, respond to the American Heart Association call was to develop an institution-wide QT alert system. And this is where Dr. Caraballa and his expertise came in, is how do we set up a cl clinical decision support like this where we would flag a particular level of QT prolongation, bring that to the ordering physician's attention, and inform them that their patient owns a level of QT prolongation that they would be wise to delve into, to look into, to see if that is an individual who could be at risk for QT-related sudden death. So, Pedro, what did we do in terms of actually setting it up? Trying to, de to deliver this knowledge uh, to each provider each time that they see a patient is a significant challenge. Uh, but right now we have the electronic medical record um, and we have systems uh, called clinical decision support systems that allow us to embed an algorithm, a computer algorithm, that will be able to detect those abnormal uh, QT and uh, deliver that information uh, during the normal workflow to those providers that are then um, able to do something to prevent a major complication or a side effect from that event. Um, these systems are developed uh, with the help of clinicians that have significant expertise in the area, and the technology to do that um, exists in Mayo, and we are trying to develop that not only for prolonged QT, but for multiple conditions that will uh, to gain similar benefits. And so it's not about just setting it in motion. So we set it in motion, we developed it, we institution-wide delivered it, but then we needed to, and we decided that part of this was to see are we doing good by it? Are we, did we set the QT alert at the right threshold? Or are we crying wolf 
too many times. And so that was the purpose of this study, was to see how are we doing, what fine-tuning do we need to do with this marker, just how actionable is this QT alert? Because after all, to, for some of you, you may not even know what the QT interval is reflecting. It's a non-invasive electrocardiographic measurement of the stability of the heart's recharging system. And when it is longer than normal, or prolonged QT or QT prolongation, that's an indicator that the individual might be vulnerable to a QT-triggered fatal arrhythmia called torsade de point. And so we set, based upon the literature and our knowledge about drug-induced long QT syndrome and genetically mediated long QT syndrome, we set a threshold of a corrected QT interval or a QTC over 500 milliseconds. And so instituted in November 2010, we looked at seven months worth of data, and that was over, over 50,000 patients from the Mayo Clinic at that time had received an electrocardiogram. There were over 80,000 electrocardiograms obtained in those 50 plus thousand patients. And the first thing we learned is that the QT alert was activated in about 2% of those patients. About 1,000 patients had a QTC over 500 milliseconds. About half of those had a pure, no other reason for their QT prolongation, so pure, isolated, lone QT prolongation above 500 milliseconds. So we find that the alert is happening about 2% of the time, of which half of them have isolated QT prolongation of 500 milliseconds or more, and that is significantly prolonged. By all studies in the literature, that threshold is a threshold for increased vulnerability to drug-induced sudden death and so forth. The next step then was to say, so what? Who are we identifying? And is it, in fact, in our institution, a non-invasive marker that would predict sudden death or early cardiovascular mortality as it's been published in the literature? And indeed it was. In fact, it surprised us quite a bit. Basically, if you had a QT alert or if your patient uh, owned a prolonged QT interval, that patient had a 1 in 5 chance, a 20% mortality at one year. And that's compared to all of the other patients who had electrocardiograms for whatever reason where the background rate of mortality was at 5%. So one year, a four times greater risk of having a death, whether sudden or not sudden, potentially attributable in one way or another to QT prolongation. But then what we did next was look to ask the question, why? What is it about their QT prolongation? Why are they prolonged? So for example, 10% of these patients with a prolonged QT alert were my patients in the long QT syndrome clinic with genetically mediated long QT syndrome. In contrast to that 20% one-year mortality, their mortality was zero, partially or potentially because they are well-diagnosed, well-risk stratified, and well-treated. So just because you had a QT alert, it wasn't a one-size-fits-all as to the potential for a tragic outcome or a premature death. And in fact, what we found through the electronic medical record is that the reason you were above, Q, above 500 milliseconds for your QTC mattered a lot. And in fact, what mattered the most is not the underlying diseases that are known to bother the QT interval, like long QT syndrome, like coronary disease, like diabetes. Many, many medical conditions can aggravate the QT interval and prolong the QT interval. Instead, it was reversible factors. And we found that one-third of the patient's pro-QTC points, in other words, the QT aggravating factors known to bother the QT interval were medications. And we derived a, what we've called for now, what was it, a pro? Pro-QT yeah. index. Yeah, the pro-QT index or the pro-QTC score where we can electronically sift through and pull out and say at the time of that QT interval or that electrocardiogram, what was their electrolyte status? 
Low potassium can prolong the QT interval. Low magnesium can do the same. What medications were they on? What were their diseases present at the time? Were they a dialysis patient, patient and so forth? And what we saw in this pro-QTC index is of all of the patients above 500, so you had to get an alert, first of all, their mortality actually ranged from 0%, like my long QT syndrome patients, to 40% in one year. And most of the reasons in the pro-QTC score that predicted this early mortality were modifiable properties and reversible things like electrolyte abnormalities and exposure to QT prolonging drugs. So if you were above 500 milliseconds but you were a genetically mediated long QT patient as the reason you're above 500, risk was low. But if you had a QTC alert and we delved into it and found out that the reason you were above 500 milliseconds is because you had low potassium, low magnesium, and you were on two or three drugs with an unwanted QT prolonging side effect, that person's risk was over 40%. So I think some of the things we've learned from it is we've got the marker set about right. We've got to fine tune it. Maybe there's some adjustments that need to be made to make it as actionable as can be. We also have learned that in our institution of the patients receiving care at Mayo Clinic, it is a non-invasive marker of early mortality. Very high. And now the next step in this exercise of quality and safety is to see how modifiable is this index of early mortality. Can we prolong life or prevent sudden death by identifying the at-risk individual, by checking to see the reasons why their QT is prolonged, and if we can identify reversible reasons and correct the electrolytes, remove the medications, or don't add yet another drug with the potential for QT prolongation, maybe we can short-circuit the potential QT perfect storm that's about to descend on that patient and actually save lives. And so I think that's the next phase, isn't yeah. it, is to see does the alert modify physician behavior? Does the alert allow these near misses to be uh, avoided, caught in time? And it was pretty exciting to see what the next phase of this institution-wide QT alert system is going to teach us. Because I think we're right, aren't we, that yeah. we're not aware of any other institution that has initiated such an alert system. And now we just have to take the next step and get smarter about this alert system. Yeah, I think that this study was is a very important for the clinical decision support program because not only uh, confirm our initial impression that uh, this system was needed, was important for the physician, no expert in cardiology or expert reading an electrocardiogram to be aware of an abnormal QT, uh, but also is expanding our knowledge. Um, is telling us other factors that we need to look at when the uh, provider is seeing those patients and will allow us to improve the alert system. Uh, we are already working in version two of this uh, uh, rule uh, to incorporate some of this new knowledge into the rule and perhaps achieve that level of behavioral change that uh, hopefully will occur and the provider will be able to look at those medications and the, uh, discontinue the medication or probably be more aggressive fixing electrolyte abnormalities or even doing a, a more accurate follow-up for those patients. I think that this, uh, the importance of the, of the evaluation of the clinical impact of the decision support system and even the clinical outcome is of a very significant, is extremely important for us and we are very happy that Dr. Ackerman and his team has engaged in this type of research. Well, thank you very much. We're, as you can tell, excited to share our work with you, and we look forward to uh, the next generation of our QT alert system. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We hope you benefited from this presentation based on the content of Mayo Clinic proceedings. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. 
If you're interested in more information about Mayo Clinic Proceedings, visit our website at www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find additional videos on our YouTube channel, and you can follow us on Twitter. For more information on health care at Mayo Clinic, please visit www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.